Hello and welcome to the Musicians Map podcast. I'm Kane Power. Music promotion is a bottomless well of confusion and frustration for independent artists. It can seem like just getting people to hear your music is the most difficult aspect of being a musician. Rather than talking about ad campaigns, PR companies and Spotify playlists, this week's episode is about sharing and influence from the perspective of your audience. How they find you, how they hear you, how they absorb your message, and most importantly, how they spread your music. This is not like the promotion and PR advice from the perspective of companies and labels dealing with big artists and big money advertising campaigns. This is essential grassroots promotion and is the most effective way to reach your target audience and build your following from the ground up. We're going to talk about why recommendations are the most important, effective way to spread your music and where your audience gets their recommendations from. We discuss authenticity and the importance of having a genre and a niche. To help provide some perspective, I've enlisted David Zeidler. David is a music fan and music writer. He absorbs music and spreads it organically through reviews, articles, Facebook groups and message boards, influencing a wider group to hear music he thinks is special. Not only this, but David releases compilations and organises gigs and music festivals, giving artists the platform to grow their following. David is what I like to call a music influencer and is the kind of conduit through which your music will spread and gain attention. Just a note about this podcast before we begin. David and I caught up over Skype and we had a few connectivity issues and as such the audio for the podcast isn't quite up to the usual standard that I'm trying to achieve. It is still, however, totally listenable and the content is incredible um, and you probably won't even notice. So here we go. David. Welcome to the Musicians Map podcast. Thank you. How are you doing? Very good. So let's start by talking about you for a while. I want to kind of tap your brain on um, discovering artists. Yeah. So to, to kick it off, what would you say is the most common way that you discover new artists? Um, probably a, a combination of uh, of friend recommendations, uh, Facebook and Bandcamp kind of working in tandem together. Um, typically that would be probably the most music I listen to is from one of those three things or a combination of all three. Sure. Facebook kind of just has this, I love the, the, the platform kind of works the best for me. I like the ability to create like groups and event pages and, uh, the, the sharing on, on Facebook tends to be, uh, the easiest for me to use, uh, like the, like the opportunity to just kind of like scroll through the feed and find like videos and, you know, songs being shared, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, that's that's kind of the one that works the best for me. Yeah, yeah, okay. So using those platforms kind of what um what's the way the main way that an artist can get your attention? Um I think that sharing some sort of solid visual material is helpful. Uh having, you know, one really good, at least one, you know, really good live performance or a music video or or actually what i think tends to stick out the most to me would be like live in studio sessions uh like i've found a lot of bands uh that i've ended up really liking through uh audio tree live stuff like that uh where the sound quality the recording quality uh you know for both the visual and the audio is is really on point um, you know, one of the first ones that I remember watching for Audio Tree was the first uh, "And So I Watch You from Afar" uh, session, and it just kind of blew me away. Uh, and and I've been following Audio Tree, you know, since then. I've discovered a lot of really good bands through that. Uh, so that certainly helps. Yeah, Audio Tree are, are amazing. I've I've uh, also discovered a few bands um, through that platform. 
Yeah, it's just it's just perfect because you can kind of you can see the band in action. Uh, you can you know you I like how they ask them questions so you get a little bit of you know background, uh, but also the the sound recording is just so good. Uh, you know a lot of times bands almost sound better on Audio Tree than they do on their album. Like there's some bands I could think of where the Audio Tree blew me away, and then the album was like good. But like I you know if I had a choice, like I'd go back and listen to their they're in studio versions. Yeah, yeah, totally. What uh, what what is the number one factor um, that you that will make you listen? Is it a recommendation, genre? Um, and we had a conversation about image before, so let's let's do that again. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, again, I would say uh, not image. Um, I think image can be detrimental sometimes. Uh, you know, the example I used before was was metalcore, where it's like. It feels sometimes like bands are trying so hard to be to like emulate the bands that have influenced them that it's distracting. You know, it's like you'll see these these bands who are essentially, uh, you know, even like indie or like small label, and they you know theoretically are just kind of like normal musician. But like they have this whole appearance that looks like prepackaged and kind of like hot topicy. Uh, you know, I'm just kind of like not not into that. It, it takes me out of the moment musically. And I and I and I, you know, use the example also of uh, of post rock, which is kind of the the opposite of that in terms of image. In that there's a, almost no image. Uh, what you tend to get uh, are very kind of like normal regular looking people um who seem to just kind of be in it 100 percent for the the artistry of it for the love of it um and you know i think that having that kind of lack of image uh helps the artistry translate even more because it just feels more authentic um in in a small even in a small way kind of just like helps the living the listening experience because the image of the band almost kind of like melts away. It's like insignificant. So like the music's able to stand, you know, out even further. Um, and it's cool to, you know, have this genre that has kind of like really dramatic, like expansive soundscape type, you know, type music. But, you know, again, like the artists themselves seem very approachable. I think that's a really cool balance being overly concerned about image is not helpful uh, for bands sure. to me. Uh, I would say that recommendation is is kind of one A, genres one B. Um, you know, I tend to listen to pretty specific genres, but you know, if there's somebody who you know I know likes good music, who I have you know similar tastes with, uh, you know, says that I need to check out some, you know, jazz record or some, like, hip-hop record that they're really into that's, you know, really interesting, you know, I'll definitely check it out. Um, even if that's not, a, you know, those aren't genres I typically I typically follow. So that definitely is, is huge for me. Uh, genre, you know, makes a big difference. You know, there was... You know, I listen to a lot of post rock, a lot of post metal, a lot of a lot of posts in, in general. <laughs> like post, I don't know, I don't know what it is about genres with the word post in front of it that appeals to me, but that tends to be the case. So I don't really question it. But there's, um, you know, there's other genres too. Like like screamo would be a great example. Um, where you know I'll tend to always check something out if it's labeled as such, uh, just because despite the fact that it's a genre that kind of has a pretty solid amount of like either generic or kind of like boring bands doing the same thing there's also this other end of it where i found like moments of uh like sort of musical transcendence within that genre you know um and there's i think the perfect example would be uh Circle Takes the Square, because I remember listening to them in 2004 and being like, holy shit, like, this is, this is exactly what I want, um, you know, so it's like the potential for those moments uh, where kind of like everything you're looking for in a band clicks in, uh, you know, definitely keeps you coming back to certain genres, even if those mo moments are kind of few and far between. Um, sure, sure, yeah. So yeah, you know. Um you you mentioned before um, the authenticity, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, I think for, for me, that's a that's a something that's huge, and it's something that I go on about all the time for people that are listening. Um, they're probably taking a big sigh. Um, but man, for, for me, I mean, okay, it's recommendations. That's kind of what usually what makes me listen. Yeah. Um, and it's recommendations throughout a number of mediums. Um, you know, it's where I've seen the artist, if it's on a favorite music website, if it's on a related artist on Spotify, if it's someone who I respect uh, or who has great taste, you know, they recommend them to me personally or throughout a group or something, um, new release from popular labels. But whenever I listen to a band or an artist, the one thing that makes me stay and that makes me actually want to listen to more is whether I see them or whether I hear them as being authentic um, because that's the thing that strikes strikes the chord and it, that's the thing that triggers that um, relatability between artist and audience um, and something that the audience can identify with um, I think is it's so so important these days especially when there's just a million bands out there doing the same thing I think that authenticity is definitely an a, a real a super interesting concept with music especially since you know as a as a listener you it's not as if you know these people who are making this music personally so there is kind of this interesting line that bands walk to uh to retain a sense of authenticity and i think that that image or lack thereof kind of goes a long way for that because uh you know there's you, you see certain bands and it's like they might their music might not be bad, but like if it looks like they're trying too hard uh, to, you know, fulfill certain roles, uh, certain like appearances, it's kind of just like off-putting. Um, but also, you know, for, there's certain genres that uh, have a tendency to, for whatever reason, kind of amp up that sense of authenticity. And I think that that's kind of like what you will get from like, as I said before, like screamo or like post rock or, you know, things where the emotional weight is really strong. Uh, Cause I think that anytime you can tie in sort of like an intense emotional reaction to anything, uh, it becomes authentic for you so it then makes the artist more authentic in your mind yeah yeah ah oh, deep <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's deep yeah. um you know what i i have i have um first-hand uh, experience with this um one of my old bands um we were playing kind of dramatic sort of progressive pop music and after a, f a few shows uh, a lot of our audience were coming up to us and saying hey you know you guys should really like capitalize on this on this sort of sound and you should present an image, you know, to your audience. You should, you know, dress up on stage and you should kind of get all the the lights and the, you know, the visuals and and really go full force. And so and we took all of that on board and we went out and got press photos, we bought clothes for us, you know, for stage performance and we dressed up and sort of played to this angle and we did that for a couple of years. And we got really sick of it because it wasn't us right uh and we, we just want to make that sort of music and and in the end we ended up ditching all of it um all the clothes all of you know just that image and once we did we found that the people who were connecting with us um were connecting with us on a deeper level and were connecting more with our music rather than just connecting with our you know the idea right of our music and so we found it much more satisfying, um, and I think we we gained a stronger fan base, even though maybe it wasn't as big. Well, I, th I think that also there's a there's a, a really important dividing line that people don't necessarily always recognize, and I think there's there's value on both sides, but I think there's you know there's a major difference between artistry and entertainment i think that especially in you know the last you know 30 years since like the you know mtv something like that made its debut uh there's been this kind of blurring of the lines where you know more bands have kind of been urged into that entertainment uh arena uh yeah. where it is more about like image and appearance and like clothes and so on and so on and, like sort of like this weird like ultra promotion uh of of yourself as as an artist 
and uh, I think that has its value. Uh, you know, I think that if you if you and if you view it that way, you know, there's plenty of people who are entertainers but not really artists, and like that's fine. And they actually probably reach a much wider audience than your average you know artist does. But I think that it's important for people who do kind of exist more in that realm of artistry to like kind of not even bother <laughs> trying to uh to breach the entertainment aspect of it. I feel like it's kind of you almost want to like keep those two things separate and like understand that there is a separation and that both again like both sides have their have their value and you know just kind of like know where where you're at with everything uh in that regard. And it almost seems sometimes like people are trying too hard to to present the image that they forget about you know the uh the actual artistry you know or it's just like there's that there's just a tendency to not even recognize that that line exists you know and i think that's where you tend to get into these arguments and this like contentious air where you know people are trash talking someone on one side or the other um, because there's this kind of like unspoken belief from a lot of people that those two things coexist, but I don't really even think they need to be coexisting. Like, I think that you, it's, it's, it's important to have your kind of like, I don't want to necessarily say like mindless entertainment, but you know, things that are meant more as just like straight up entertainment and things that are meant to be a little bit more niche and focused on the artistic aspect like so you get like the post-rock bands for instance would be a great example it's like you can mention a band that is kind of uh viewed within that 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 niche as as kind of like legendary and if you mention it to a hundred people there's a solid chance that a hundred of them will have no idea what you're talking about uh you know like so you mention a band like like i don't know like like even like isis or like red sparrows or someone like that that like it's like if you're into like post-rock post-metal like you definitely know who those bands are Mm. um but you know it's like you can go to you know people who kind of aren't existing within that realm and mention those bands and they're just like i like i have no idea what you're talking about (laughs) um but I, i don't think there's anything wrong with that you know like i don't think there's anything wrong with being really into that that realm of entertainment and kind of like that's your thing that's your thing but it's you know i think it's also kind of important to leave the two th- the two realms apart yeah totally um it's something that i'm a i'm a big fan of is um focusing on genre and finding a niche and when you do you have a loyal you can grow a loyal following within that genre and niche and the people outside of it that don't know about you they don't matter um Right. Anyway, we've gone off on a huge tangent, um, which is great. We're <laughs> yeah. going to go over the main ways that the audience, your audience, discovers your music, um, and we're talking from our perspective as an audience. The main way I think um, I discover music these days, streaming. Streaming is the first one I want to talk about. So, right. Spotify is the biggest streaming site around. Um, streaming is how so many people listen to the music. I use Spotify all the time. I think it's absolutely amazing. Um, you know, they have features like you, uh, you know, your friends come up in the feed and the side and it tells you what everyone's listening to. So people that you, that you trust, you know, you might see them listening to us, something you've never heard of and you can check that out. I think Spotify is great. Um, you, you don't use Spotify so much. You use Bandcamp more. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I, and it could be just be one of those things where I'm like being, being old and missed out on something that's really great. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. Like I've used it here and there, but I've kind of always, uh, you know, since I've gotten more into streaming kind of, um, tended more towards Bandcamp. Um, I do, I will say what I, about Spotify though, is I, you know, I've been dealing with, um, you know, a decent amount of, uh, post-rock bands sort of person to person, uh, because of, you know, various ventures that I'm involved with. And, and a big thing for a lot of them is to find their ways onto, uh, Spotify playlists. Uh, that's kind of a, a huge, uh, element of getting recognized. Uh, and it's kind of funny because it's like, you know, I, I think that a lot of the 
bands in this genre, like, they don't totally love the fact that they tend to find themselves on, like, you know, playlists to fall asleep to or playlists <laughs> for the background, <laughs> playlists for the background when you're studying, uh, you yeah. know, stuff like that. It's like, oh, well, you know, like we were like, kind of like making this thing that we were, you know, were really intensely, uh, you know, into, but like they still appreciate the fact that like there's an interest in it regardless of what that interest is. And you'll start to see bands like, uh, you know, for instance, uh, this patch of sky is a good example of a band that's done a really solid job of marketing themselves themselves and getting themselves more and more recognized, you know, especially considering the fact that they're sort of like a uh, very mellow, you know, soundscape post-rock band, like the fact that they're now, you know, on equal vision uh, and, you know, have a lot of, you know, increasing amount of Spotify plays definitely is making a, a huge difference for them and like getting their music into commercials and uh, onto, you know, onto, to, you know, film and stuff like that is kind of making a big difference. So uh, Spotify definitely has its, uh, its value in that regard. And also the related artist thing is, is great. And that's definitely a, always been a huge thing for me. Like I used to do this and this kind of, uh, you know, maybe it reveals my age a little bit, but I used to do this on Amazon, like before you had like Spotify and Bandcamp and so on and so forth. Like I would go on Amazon to buy CDs <laughs> and uh, I would look up a band that I liked. If just for instance, you know, this is back in college, I would look up like at the drive-in and it would be like, if you like at the drive-in, you know, you're probably going to like these bands. And I would look and it would be, uh, you know, like, blood brothers and these arms are snakes and yeah. sparta and i'm like okay like i like all of those bands and then you'd see one band that would pop up that you never heard of and you know chances are you're gonna check them out and be like oh okay like i like i'm definitely into this and that uh actually happens with a band who i likely never would have heard otherwise uh very very small time band uh called the north atlantic uh, and actually wrote a pretty like deep dive article for uh, Arctic Drones about their the album that I'm talking about, uh, Wires in the Wall, right now, which has become probably a top twenty all time album for me. Wow. Uh, and I f discovered that album only because I was looking at a uh, you know if you like this artist, you know, for fans of uh, feature on a website. Sure. So yeah. That's huge. It's even, I mean, you could even go, you could even go back further. Like you're talking about, you know, using the Amazon recommendations, buying CDs. Um, what about, you know, when you used to buy records from actual record stores? Right. Uh, and you go into the record store and you say, hey, have you got the new Terra record or something? And they go, yeah, yeah, it's over in hardcore. And so you go to hardcore and then you're just thumbing through all the records. And there's just band after band after band that are similar, you know. And there's probably 20 bands there easily. That's definitely, that's how I, you know, there used to be this place in uh, where I grew up in uh, in Connecticut, in Waterbury, Connecticut, called uh, Phoenix Records. I used to get so much music from there, uh, just kind of like blind buys that turned out great. Like the first, uh, my f first post-rock experience that really made a difference to me was uh, randomly picking up um, Those Who Tell the Truth by Explosions in the Sky from there. And I also, you know, learned about bands like, you know, Cave-In and Botch from, you know, recommendations from guys at the counter where I buy, like, you know, a record by, you know, who knows. Uh, you know, that's the thing. It's like I don't even necessarily remember the album I was buying at the time because it probably doesn't resonate with me anymore as much as it used to, but what ends up resonating with me were the recommendations that I picked up from, you know, the guys that worked at the store. Yeah, and again, that's recommendations where it just pops up again. Like, that's exactly the same for me. There were there were two music shops in my town uh, in Hamilton um, growing up, and the two guys that ran the two record shops you know they become almost not really friends but you know you go in there and you spend hours listening to music and checking out merch and you order cds and you say hey what should i be listening to and they always know because it's their job and so they say you should check out this band and a lot of the time i wouldn't even listen to the cd i'll just go yeah okay cool right. and buy it and take it home and listen and what do you know new favorite band you know well, I think what's what's funny too is that uh, I just, until you mentioned it right now, I didn't even really kind of like put two and two together. But uh, I think that 
I really valued the opportunity to become more like those guys as I've gotten older. I think that like I always really looked up to, you know, the people that were working at the record stores that were turning me on to things that, you know, I ended up being really into and and over time sort of my approach to music has very strongly included the desire to share music with other people um yeah. and to, you know, help turn people on to bands that you know are artists that i feel like are really worthwhile and but you know i think a lot of that desire in me to do that stems from it being so important to me when you know guys at this you know record stores would you know pass suggestions along to me when i was younger yeah yeah totally ah man it's cyclical yeah Um, now uh playlist you mentioned playlists can be influential um and they really can get your music out there right. but another another way and probably um the most common way for indie artists these days is using social media facebook is is the number one um you know you you're getting it through what your friends like um you're getting recommendations through uh, ads and the groups that you belong to and maybe some uh message groups that you belong to and um Facebook uh, has been, it's been amazing for me, and especially in the last couple of years for finding new music. And a huge part of that has been um, joining up with Arctic Drones, which is where you and I know each other from. And we have a group message, um, which which is continuous and um, people often share music on there. But also you're involved with a few a few specific genre specific groups that mm. share music. Right. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, and I and and, and to start, I also th- I think it's I think that Facebook is a really interesting thing because you know, you kind of hear people complain about like, uh, like too much politics or cat pics or like dumb memes. <laughs> uh, and like there's there's absolutely that component if you allow for it, but uh but also if you like I tend to, you know, use Facebook I would say 85%, you know, in one way or another as a, and it's actually as a social networking platform, like, which is what it initially was supposed to be. Uh, and it's, I love it. Uh, you know, like I, it, it's opened me up to relationships with artists and writers and, you know, people that do events and so on and so forth from all over the world. Uh, which is fantastic, you know. Like I, I learned about Artie Drones through Facebook. Uh, so many other publications, blogs, labels, uh, you know, shows I might not have known were happening otherwise. Events, uh, you know, it's just for me. Like I kind of, you know, I think a lot of people you know, think about Facebook as like being stuff you don't care about from people you don't care about that you were acquainted with in high school. But honestly, like I kind of cut that whole element out of my, uh, my Facebook news feed and mostly who I'm friends with on there now are people like working within the, the realm of, of music or film or, uh, you know, I, I like a lot of, uh, like labels and, uh, you know, movie theaters and places that do events. So, you know, my news feed actually is a news feed about things that directly interest me. Yeah. It's been a great networking tool. It's put me in, in, in touch with a lot of, you know, people who have, you know, really kind of enriched my life. Um, but in terms of what you're talking about with the, uh, groups, you know, I initially started, this group that was called kind of really generically called song of the day. And then, uh, it was, you know, probably 70 or 80 people, uh, that I was friends with on Facebook that I added to the group, probably about 65 of which really didn't give a crap about what I was doing. <laughs> um, and at, at this, and then it kind it became ultimately became known, uh, more sophomorically as boner jams uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> and then it's now just b jams i kind of just uh abbreviated it just just in case just so it's not like people don't think it's like a porn group or something <laughs> uh because like essentially what this group is is me trying to like put my favorite music out into the world and you know it's like sort of a a virtual mix cd and my 
idea for it initially was basically uh, it was it was just a place to share music with like-minded people um you know for a long time it was just basically me sharing stuff and people would sometimes like it or sometimes not care but as time's gone has gone on it's gone from having you know 70 or 80 people to you know having over 600 people relatively small but it's um what the thing that i find to be really cool about it is that at this point in time probably 90 percent of that 600 people uh are people who are musicians blog writers um you know people that work on you know music events work in the music industry in some way shape or form so it's you know kind of cool to have all these people who are just like actively involved in music uh sharing music back and forth and i think that that's a um something that maybe won't translate to every person but uh a, a very underrated thing about getting involved in you know arctic drones and some of the other things i've been doing like working with a thousand arms and working with uh like the dunk festival is that i become friends with more and more musicians and you know these are musicians whose you know music i admire so you know what better recommendation for music to listen to can you get then recommendations from artists who are making music you already like um yeah yeah and that and that's kind of what i've really i think that b jams has kind of blossomed into 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 that where you know it's it's small but it's got a lot of really really solid recommendations a lot of really good music being shared uh it's you know it's obviously very concentrated uh it's very like niche heavy but um you know i've discovered lots of great bands from there and i think i've you know been able to to share out a lot of you know music that people have appreciated so that's kind of something about facebook that i love is it it not only gives you the uh, an easy opportunity to share music and to have music shared with you but it kind of like puts it can put the artists and the fan in the same room together um mm. which i think is is really important really interesting it's it's you know it's it kind of makes music feel a little bit more tangible you know once you realize like oh these are like real people that have your know, regular jobs as well that are like on facebook like i am um but also happen to be like making music that i'm really into um you know kind of adds a really interesting component to the listen the music listening experience yeah it does um what i what i think that we're really starting to tap into is people's desire to share music that they are passionate about yeah and from an artist's perspective um you know that's maybe something that you should be focusing on um is is what we talked about before you know th throughout through your own experience and th through your own authentic voice um to connect to people and create tangible relationships and a, a real connection is so valuable because the people that do connect with you uh, are going to feel a part of your art and feel a part of your music and your movement and your message and they're going to be more inclined to to share your music with with people on the platforms that they use and i think that's definitely the most powerful way to spread your music is through passionate people because as as we're kind of coming to realize is that's what everyone wants to do. Everyone wants to tell people either how good a band is or how good uh, their music taste is or, you know, for whatever reason, people want to share. Yeah, I mean, word of mouth will never not be huge. That's just that's just the way it is, you know? Like, it's, yeah. you know, word of mouth matters to the people putting it out there in the world because they feel like they've become uh, sort of an important component sort of like a conduit in the process you know it's like you know you love this music and really like the way you become active in it is to get other people to love it uh, but then also you know word of mouth is huge for people on the other side uh because you know people who maybe aren't as intensely actively involved uh you know they need to look somewhere for guidance uh so you know word of mouth is kind of you know, a huge aspect of that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, so what about um, other social media? Um, YouTube, 
I mean, there's obviously, it's a huge medium. Again, you know, one of the most um, used sites in the world for music. I think a lot of YouTube, um, the influence it has is obviously, it's a visual influence. Mm. Um, so not only not only does it give you the uh, the music to listen to and to capture your attention and your senses in that way, but also the the visual element that, that you can connect with and relate to. YouTube has been really big for me. That was kind of like the main platform from which I used to share music. Uh, most of the music that I would share in, in my group would be, you know, from YouTube. Uh, and I think, you know, that the we spoke about this before, you know, the visual component is can, can be a huge thing. Uh, but I think also especially for uh, for independent music and sort of like niche genres. Uh, the Again, we're going back to the if you like this artist, check out this artist. But that, uh, that right side bar on YouTube where it's like, you know, if that just gives you like the list of videos that are going to play afterwards, after you watch this video, the related videos uh, are huge. Like, and going back to, to post-rock again, I mean, there's... I used to call it the uh, the post rock vortex, uh, where if you like search, if you see search one band that you like, and then you start just randomly clicking on you know related videos on the right side of the screen. I mean, you can get lost for days. Um, it's a wormhole. It really, it really is. And I mean, for better or for worse, because I mean, sometimes you're going through a dozen bands and you're like oh my god it's like exhausting you know how like kind of like similar it is but then every once in a while you find a band that's just incredible uh and you know i've definitely fallen into that void uh numerous times uh so there i think that's probably for me the most valuable aspect of youtube is that ability to just kind of like constantly cycle through more and more material there's just so much of a, a wealth of of music on there yeah yeah there really is especially with everyone you know putting out it's where a lot of people start you know uh when they haven't got a recording they you know they whack up a video of themselves on youtube right. um playing guitar or whatever um you know and so there's all of that as well as all of the professionally made videos and everything else so yeah i mean it's an extremely powerful tool and a great way for your audience to identify and relate to you through visual, uh, for, through your visual aspect. If you look at, uh, at, you know, there's definitely certain artists too that, you know, have become fairly well regarded within the genres that we're talking about here. Uh, like that young from Covet, you know, event, like she eventually found band members from her just posting videos of herself doing like finger tapping acoustic stuff and like you know songs that she had been working on and just putting them on YouTube and she kind of just got more and more and more views and then ultimately you know that led to her having a you know a f large fan following that led her to be able to find you know band members to create like a full you know a full complement and now it's like you know you see you know Covet going out on tour with pretty awesome artists uh and that really all started from you know uploaded youtube videos yeah i mean the most famous example that's that's a great example um the most famous one is is bieber isn't it um yeah th right, exactly. that's literally how he got his break uploading acoustic videos to youtube um but that's another conversation as well. That's <laughs> yeah. a whole another powerful, powerful side of the industry. Um, let's move on to music media, um, music, music blogs uh, in particular. Um, and I'm using the term blog to encompass, you know, just fan sites and, and, and magazines. But where, mm. you know, the, the mainstream is influenced by, um, you know, mainstream sites like Pitchfork, Drown and Sound, Stereo Gum, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the big ones, right? But as an artist, as an artist, those sites are almost impossible to get onto, right? Um, I think out of all of the years that I've been promoting my own music to those sorts of sites, I think Drowned and Sound might have featured me once or twice. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's it's difficult, but there's a whole different side. Also, sometimes those bigger publications, since they have to play to a wider audience, and there's so much, uh, you know demand for clicks you'll kind of get like obnoxious content too like pitch for kind of uh their recent like constant spamming of lil peep and it's like 
you <laughs> or it's like you if you actually like pay attention to it and then look at the comments essentially everyone hates this guy but like he gets clicks so they share a, a article about Lil Peep like every five days so you know there's there's certainly downsides to those larger publications as well there definitely is I mean it's starting to get into the realm of mainstream radio you know where you're kind of thinking about now I don't want to accuse anyone but you're thinking about our, our labor you know, kind of controlling the content that's getting onto these publications because they have such a huge reach. Right. Um, again, I think that's a whole nother tangent, but I'm, I think <laughs> what I want to focus on is the, the underground sites, mm-hmm. or not even really underground sites, but independent sites, smaller sites, genre-specific niche sites like Arctic Drones. These sites have communities of fans who are passionate about the genre, um, they're going to like almost everything that shows up on the site because right. it is within their their realm. So, I mean, what which which sort of sites do you use? Well, yeah, and and actually, that's I think another uh, just very quickly going back to the importance of, of the Facebook and like social media is like I learned about Ari Drones through uh, through Facebook, um, but also I the the initial uh, like post rock Facebook page that sort of spawned uh, Ari Drones eventually uh, I think was probably one of the most massively important places where I discovered music. For a, not for a couple of years in a row, you know, especially like all basically all the new post rock bands and post metal bands I was getting into, I was getting into directly from recommendations from from that page. So it was sort of natural for me when I was seeking out, uh, you know, a site to write for. Arctic Drones was the first one that popped into my mind because it was really the the one that in, had influenced me the most uh, and had kind of enriched my listening experience the most. And, it, you know, it's it's nice to have something that has a, I guess, smaller scope, you know, covers like a, f- a few genres very intensely, mm. uh, and especially when it comes to genres that aren't really covered that much by by other publications i mean it's like we're still in a place as much as there's been a huge global explosion explosion of of post-rock bands you know from every corner of the world especially over the last 15 years i i I can't really necessarily think of a genre that's grown as exponentially as as post-rock has but still it's at a point where you have to often explain what post-rock is to almost anyone that you mention you mention it too, so it's still it's still a, a very like niche space within music. So it's cool to have that you know publication that with good writers that can be like a trusted source, and that's kind of like the way I view uh, like heavy blog is heavy for uh, for like metal and ha- you know heavier music, post metal stuff like that. Um, you know Brooklyn Vegan, as much as I. Their their name is somewhat um, misleading yeah. <laughs> because I I had had seen I'd seen the name for a long time and I assumed that it was exactly what it sounded like but they actually uh, share a ton of you know really cool like indie rock and post punk post hardcore emo stuff like that that tends to be kind of my go to for for those genres you know indie rock mm. type stuff. Um, Substream is good. Um, I think that they have some very talented writers, and I think they have some really interesting and very like personalized approaches to reviewing music. Like their writers, you know, will often sort of like tie it into their personal life and like tell a story, which I think you know definitely has has a lot of value um, in connecting with an audience. Yeah. Um, so those ones all definitely uh, resonate with me, and I think that one that really is underrated, maybe not, maybe underrated isn't the word because at this point in time, Bandcamp is really pretty well known. But Bandcamp's uh, like music journalism department is awesome. Uh, like they they share some really interesting material uh you know and, and it's and they they do some deep dives into into really really specific 
small like niche genres that like make post rock look like you know it's just pop music yeah uh like <laughs> like they i they, it's music that i might sometimes aren't i'm not even necessarily that into but just the fact that they're like dedicated to bringing music like dungeon synth <laughs> like into the into into the light i think is super valuable like i i love the fact that they do that um and they really kind of try to like touch upon these undiscovered sort of islands uh of genres that you might never know exist otherwise even if you're somebody like myself who's really into music uh you know like they did an entire piece on like horror folk uh you know it's like super interesting you know like basically like bands that sound like they are like playing in the background of the wicker man yeah uh, and it's like who knew that who knew there was more than one of those bands um you know and they also do like really awesome read stuff uh like i discovered a lot of really cool bands through an article that they did on costa rican indie rock so i i like that dedication to having these very focused uh like deep dives yeah yeah i mean we're i mean we're talking so much about um genre and niche and i think it's really highlighting how important it is um and over everything else i think we've you know covered a few topics um and there's more that i thought um i would we would get into and maybe that's um pretense for a whole new whole nother podcast you could just go so far into into each aspect that we've kind of briefly covered but i think the the general theme is that genre and niche is is so integral um to finding your fans and to growing your fan base and to um getting getting a base of people that will around you that will support you um and share you um and that's how you're really going to spread yeah absolutely so I do a segment called the Band of the Week or the Artist of the Week, uh, and this week I would be honored if you would um, put forward your nomination. Uh, am I allowed to do like new band and old band? Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so yeah, because I, I kind of been splitting my week between two bands uh, as I've been listening to uh, a ton of the new uh, Rosetta album, which yeah. is they, they're a band that has definitely uh taken leaps and bounds that have resonated with me uh like a, a lot of their earlier material was super heavy but they've added this uh really amazing melodic aspect to their music uh and their their new album kind of touches even more on that than the than the previous one uh so Rosetta is definitely definitely on that list um, and then I kind of randomly, and again, this is a band camp thing, just a random band camp discovery, uh, is a band called Sounds Like Violence that I absolutely should have been listening to when I was in my early 20s. I don't know why, how I missed them, uh, but I've been listening to their uh, EP, The Pistol, uh, kind of on repeat for the last several days. Uh, they're sort of a uh, kind of very visceral sort of cross between which sounds weird but a cross between like refused and the and like the killers which sounds kind of uh, very like sort of disparate influences but uh, they kind yeah, of yeah yeah no i could see that yeah they kind of fall like somewhere in between those two bands uh but they've been they've been doing a lot for me lately so the it was Rosetta, uh, Uto new album Ut Utopioid, yep. and then sounds like violence on uh, the their first EP is called the Pistol. David, thank you so much, mate. Yeah, thank you for having me. And that's the podcast for this week. Thank you so much to my guest David Zeidler. Make sure to check out his work for Arctic Drones, the Dunk USA Music Festival, and his compilations through A Thousand Arms, Open Language, and Hemispheres. You'll find links to all these things and more in the podcast description. This podcast and my site, musiciansmap.org, is dedicated to sharing knowledge and advice about music and the music industry. It's all about honesty and positive progress. My experience is yours to learn from. There are no hidden meanings, ambiguous statements or industry secrets, just results. 
Much of my experience, advice, and information is condensed into both ebook and audiobook form, both of which are available on the website. I discuss every aspect of learning music from listening and learning an instrument to recording, gigging, touring, and making money as a musician. For those of you wanting to get serious or looking for more immediate results, I offer one on one development sessions and song critiques. These are intensely focused super sessions designed to provide clarity and purpose to achieving your goals. I've also got a ton of free stuff, including a free five-step challenge to a clear musical pathway, so head to musiciansmap.org to take advantage of all of the resources on offer. Make sure to get in touch with your comments and suggestions and let me know what challenges you are facing at the moment over at the Musicians Map Facebook group. I always respond. Thanks for listening and stay positive. Music